I will set more or less. So hopefully there will be uh, fewer complications this afternoon than there were yesterday. Uh, do you all have at this point a uh, login? So we should all be set in that regard. Um, today will be about the same, uh, the same approach as yesterday. But uh, I'll be clear. Uh, Writing lots of code together is going to be strange. I need to figure out how to do this. Uh, the easy way out is the following. I give you the code, and then we talk about what the various pieces do, and then we run things together. Um, I fear that this is maybe missing part of the point. So I'd like you, at some point, to actively think about what are the needed pieces that need to come into play as you put together this, uh, this code. So as much as possible, even though we have the solution that just taken the code that's online and that you should have access to, it should be labeled somehow, tutorial 2 or something like this, I'd like us to work towards that and not just take it as a given. But we'll see, we'll see how this works. Um, the, the plan for, uh, am I speaking loud enough? Can you hear me in the back? Yeah, it's good. Um, so th the plan for uh, today will be fairly light in terms of numerics because what we talked about this morning is not complicated. It's a set of ODEs. We're not going to lose sleep over that. So we'll talk briefly about how we put this, uh, those ODEs together uh, from a num uh, numerical standpoint. It's going to take us, I don't know, at, at most half an hour, I would think. Uh, and then I'll ask you to think a bit about the various pieces that will need to come into play as you put together a, uh, a, uh, a solution method, a computational method for solving the equations we talked about this morning. So we'll think about the various pieces that come into play and, uh, and then we'll, uh, uh, we'll try to at least carve out what they might look like. And then, only then, we'll turn our attention back to the code. Um, and, and then I'll, I'll walk you through some of the more tedious stuff the stuff that uh, doesn't have a lot of added value, uh, in particular the uh, I.O. side of things. So I'll, I'll show you a ready-to-go I.O. Uh, and, then, and then we'll start thinking about the meat of the, of the problem. So what are the necessary pieces in order to, to do particle transport? The approach we're going to use today is the following. We'll take the flow that we finished up with uh, uh, yesterday which was this uh, flow on, a, on the cylinder, which is an unsteady flow. And we will start uh, adding particles to this. Uh, we'll use, uh, we'll uh, start with that using uh, uh, Lagrangian particle tracking. Okay? We'll be following individual particles using the equations that, uh, that we discussed this morning. If I'm not mistaken, oh, thank you. If I'm not mistaken, let me check the, the plan. So yeah, the plan is for tomorrow to do the same thing, but using Eulean methods. OK, so we're going to have a point-wise Lagrangian like, description today, and tomorrow a uh, fluid-like hydrodynamic description of groups of particles. OK. So like I said, we're not going to do too much uh, regarding the numeric side of things. I'll just summarize the equations, you know, how far we're going to want to, uh, to go in terms of uh, the equations we're going to want to solve. So we're going to do uh, uh, Lagrangian <coughs> particle tracking. So for a single P, well, for the position X sub P and velocity U sub P of the particle. Uh, well, and I, I guess I'm going to change the notation from this morning. Now I'm realizing. Well, it doesn't matter. You're, you can uh, you can adapt. Uh, so the equations are the following: we're solving dxp 
dt is equal to up. And we're solving dup over dt. This is where we're going to make use of what we've done this morning. We'll stick to something fairly straightforward. We will use a uh, correction coefficient that will be a function of the Reynolds number of the particle times the difference between the fluid velocity and the particle velocity divided by tau p that we talked about this morning. Uh, and I, I don't remember whether we have gravity, but we'll, we'll add gravity to this. And in this, tau p is the particle relax relaxation time, which is 1 over 18. So we derived it, well, quickly. I guess I just told you what it is, but I told you how to get it. Uh, times the density of the fluid times the diameter of the particle squared divided by the viscosity of the fluid. OK, so this is the simple set of equations we're proposing to solve. One uh, angle that we'll take to discuss this uh, equation uh, today will be something that we'll talk more about tomorrow. Uh, that's going to be the concept of Stokes number. This is something that I imagine a good number of you know. A good number of you might not be aware of what it is. It is going to be a key describing the dynamics of particles. And that is the ratio of the flow time scale to the particle time scale. Tau F for fluid. Uh, what did I do? Yes, you are correct. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, so uh, let me see. I was quickly checking that I didn't have the bug, uh, that I didn't type this up in the code. Uh, so uh, to the flow time scale tau f uh, to the particle time scale tau p. So this s, the Stokes number will write as st, and it will be tau p. <laughs> over tau f. So it's another way for us to think about whether the particle looks more like a uh, cannonball or a fluid tracer. A large Stokes number will mean that the particle will take a very long time in comparison uh, to adapt to the fluid uh, velocity in comparison to the actual uh, uh, rate at which the fluid velocity changes. And therefore, it will essentially behave as a cannonball, being very little uh, affected by the fluid. The other way around, the low Stokes number, vanishing Stokes number, will mean that the particle adjusts infinitesimally fast to changes in the fluid velocity that occur on a much larger time scale. And therefore, the, the particle will just follow the streamlines. So we'll, we'll go. Um, Saying again? What should be the other way around? So a large Stokes mean a uh, very sl uh, very long response time for the particles. So this is correct. So this is the ratio of okay. Oh, uh, you mean I, I, I <laughs> yes, OK. Uh, yes. Inverse. There you go. Yes, I, I, the, 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 what I said in the text is what I wrote down is, is not what the equation I wrote. Thank you. OK. Um, so, okay, anyway, so we'll, we'll be looking at this uh, in our test. One of the most common ways that, uh, that those uh, equations are going to be integrated, so this set of uh, ODEs. So here, you know, if we're solving this in, uh, in 2D, this is going to be four coupled ODEs 
in 2D. The way this is going to be solved will be, well, a range of methods. Uh, it is rarely, so, so I'll make a, a broad statement here, but um, it's not necessarily particularly uh, applicable to uh, all situations. It's rarely necessary to go after an implicit integration of those equations. Uh, because it is often the case that if you're tracking particles, you're interested in the dynamics of those particles, and therefore you're interested in being accurate in terms of what the response of, of those particles are going to be. Uh, the one situation where you might need to start thinking about um, using implicit methods, a situation where you have a near-perfect tracer and the particle responds so fast that you, you, really don't want, you really don't need to resolve how fast it responds to the flow because it ends up just following the flow uh, itself. So we'll talk about one way that you can deal with that that's maybe more convenient than an implicit solver. But in general, the idea is you're going to want your Lagrangian solver to be based, to be capable of solving for many, many particles. And an implicit solver would cost significantly more than an explicit solver. And as such, it would prevent you from running a large number of particles. So we'll often look for Uh, explicit approaches, so often solved explicitly. I'll give you uh, two obvious examples. Um, Arun Shkuda 4, RK4, is probably, I would say, the most commonly found integration approach for those equations in the literature. Uh, for the sake of completeness, we'll recast our problem as such. A d phi dt is equal to some right inside of phi. The Runge-Kuda 4 will be a four-step algorithm where we will estimate first phi at the n plus 1 half time as a first estimate, so I'll put a star here, from phi at the end time using a, an explicit forward Euler. So we'll do a half step starting from phi n. Now that we have an estimate at the mid-time step, we're going to build a second estimate, but for symmetry, we're not going to do it with forward Euler. We're going to do it with backward Euler. So we're going to do a phi n plus 1 half, a second estimate, so a double star estimate. And this one will obtain from backward differencing. We're not going to make it implicit. We're going to use the star value in order to estimate the right hand side. Okay, so we're doing a forward Euler step from n to n plus 1 half. This is our first guess. We take this to do the backward Euler step from n to n plus 1 half. This is our second step. The third step will have us do a full uh, time step that's centered in time this time. So we'll go all the way to n plus 1. That's going to be our third estimate. Starting from n, we're going to do a full time step going to uh, using as a right hand side n plus 1 half star star. So that's a centered. Uh, if we were to stop here, so now we're going to make use of canceling errors in the Taylor series by combining the three different estimates uh, we've, we've built so far. Well, uh, yeah, the three different estimates we've built so far. So we'll do that as a final step to get a final n plus 1 value. And this one will be phi n plus dt over 6. And then we'll combine everything here. So we'll have f 
estimated from phi n plus 1 star star star. Then we'll have 2 f estimated from phi n plus 1 half star star and then plus 2 f phi n plus 1 half star and finally plus f estimated from the old time from phi n. So this is a very standard algorithm. It's used everywhere. Uh, the properties are pretty good. The main interest in this uh, algorithm is the fact that it provides for the accuracy. It is, however, a multi-step algorithm requiring four evaluations right inside, so it can be fairly expensive. So four steps, and it remains fully explicit. That means that stability will require delta t to be less. If we go back to our particle uh, problem, our particle response time is our characteristic time scale in this problem. So we will need our particle response time, uh, sorry, our, mesh, uh, uh, our, our uh, delta t to be significantly smaller than the particle response time. So typically that will have to be less than tau p over some coefficient. Uh, I'm not else here, but essentially stability requires you to resolve this time scale. Uh, this is many variants. That's either or the variables. We're not, we're not going to worry too much about that. This is a simplified version of that. We'll simply do a second order Runga Kuda. So we'll do an RK2 which boils down to a two-step exercise. Step one is going to be a phi n plus one-half that will be estimated from phi n plus delta t over two times f of phi n. So we do a forward Euler first order explicit step from the time n to the mid-time n plus one. And once we've done that, we'll do a second step going from phi n all the way to plus 1 using, for our right side calculation, phi n plus 1 half, our estimated phi n plus 1 half. Because the second step is set and centered in time, this approach will be formally second order accurate. It is still explicit. It requires two steps, so we're going to have to evaluate essentially our drag law twice, and that will require us to you know, make um, uh, to provide some additional storage for our variables. So this is uh, RK2 second order. Uh, two steps, explicit. So that's what we're going to do. Um, if your Stokes number is really small and you're still interested in using, so first of all I would say if your Stokes number is very small, there's many reasons why you might want to look at, an, at a Eulean approach and for a particle field. We'll talk about that tomorrow. Um, you have some reason why you want to track the uh, the particle trajectory 
even though you know that those particles trajectories are going to respond very quickly to uh, fluid uh, velocity and therefore it will essentially track those particles will essentially track the fluid um, if you still want to use the Lagrangian method the cost is going to become very large because essentially the particle trajectory will be tied to the fluid the fluid particle trajectories um, but you'll need to respond you'll need to integrate your equations on the time scale that's controlled by your particle response time which is much less than the fluid response time so in that case uh, it makes a lot of sense to use a semi-analytic approach and the idea here is pretty simple uh, if your particle response time is very small compared to your fluid time, it is reasonable to essentially assume your fluid velocity to be constant during your integration time. And as a result, the problem you're solving is a very simple uh, ODE integration uh, for the uh, problem. So if ST is much less than one, then you can assume to be approximately constant and therefore now the problem that you're solving boils down to a d phi dt is equal to a phi over a characteristic time scale. Okay? It's here our phi is really now a, 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 a up minus uf if you will but it's a constant shift. Okay? So it's particularly uh, you can get an analytical solution of the form equal to phi n minus over your characteristic time tau. And now that becomes unconditionally stable. Because you're analytically integrating this equation, there's no CFL associated with that. So that can make a lot of sense, again, if you're looking at small systems. We're going to use, uh, well, except if there's any question. Okay, so that's what we're going to use uh, for our purpose. Now, what do we need in terms of code development? What is going to be necessary? I'll fill out some of these. Uh, I argued yesterday that it's extremely convenient to be able to look on the fly at what's going on with your calculation. So I'm adamant that we need some I.O. for particles. And I'll provide that. What else? Well, just talked about. We need the integrate and it's going to be our sorry interpolation of velocity yes so if we scroll back up here we've hidden certainly one complexity here in what this UF here is. This UF is the fluid velocity that the particle sees. It is essentially the fluid velocity at the position of the particle. The particle has no reason to sit on the locations of our, uh, on our grid where the fluid velocity is going to be stored. As a result, 
we'll need to interpolate from the nearby cells onto the location of our particle. So right here, this is really UF at position XP. And because it's UF at position XP, down there, one big item is going to be get UF of XP from UF and the knowledge of XP. So we could spend a significant amount of time talking about how one can do that. What we've heard here is the, probably the most natural way one can do that, and that's just by interpolation. Uh, then the question is what type of interpolation you want to do. That in itself is a topic that could take us a, a while to discuss. Uh, the code that we have is second order accurate. We have introduced here, uh, at least I'm saying that we'll use a second order Runge CUDA. Uh, if we stick to that uh, flavor of second order accuracy, a pretty reasonable approach that's simple to put in would be a simple linear interpolation. So this is what we're going to be using here. Technically speaking, we're in 2D, so it's going to be a bilinear interpolation. Uh, if you have a 3D code, you'll need a trilinear interpolation. Okay? You could go to high order uh, interpolations. It makes a lot of sense. If you're doing high order DNS type of studies, then the common approach is to use uh, high order polynomials in order to interpolate your, local veloc uh, your velocity field to the local particle position. What else? Say it again. So uh, the, the coupling question uh, will will uh, okay. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but uh, fair enough. Um, so we didn't talk about that this morning, and we'll talk about that very soon. But the point is. What we discussed about this morning is essentially you know, the description of the drag force. The drag force is the rate at which the fluid transfers momentum to the particle. Well, this is a conservative process. If the fluid transfers a momentum to the particle, then similarly the particle is taking that momentum from the fluid. And therefore, what shows up as a drag force on the particle equation should show up as minus of that drag force on the fluid equation side of things. So that's something that we potentially need to account for, and we'll talk about conditions where this needs to be accounted for uh, tomorrow morning. Um, but that's something that we can certainly talk about here. So uh, an additional step here would be account for drag. in Navier-Stokes equation. I'm going to put that in parentheses because this is not going to be the main focus right now. Uh, what is the next step? What else do we need? So there's one hidden, hidden uh, aspect here, or maybe not necessarily hidden, but this linear interpolation, uh, or any type of interpolation from the, um, from the surrounding fluid onto the particle, that requires, in fact, one additional step that for us is going to be very easy, but that in the general sense uh, can be tricky, especially if you're looking at um, unstructured codes. So in order to interpolate from the surrounding grid points onto your position XP, you need to know which are your surrounding grid points. So at some point, there's also an important step that is the localization of the particle onto the grid. So if you have a Cartesian grid, you're going to need to, be, uh, you're going to, need to have an efficient scheme that allows you to identify the corresponding IJ that is closest to your particle. 
So that's going to be a localization step. Localize particle onto a mesh. This is not a complicated task if you have given yourself a simple grid like we have. We have a uniform grid. Everything is going to be easy. It's not complicated from the knowledge of the position to find the corresponding IJ index. Now imagine if you have an unstructured mesh. If you have a large collection of triangles uh, or tetrahedra or uh, prisms of which you know the position and the neighbors only. That's what an unstructured mesh looks like. Now localizing a particle becomes a significantly more involved search algorithm that requires essentially finding which is the closest prism or, or tetrahedron or polyhedron or whatever that contains a particle. And that's going to be more expensive. Yes? Okay, let me sketch this. So, we have a grid. And now, consider a particle, say it's sitting right here. By solving the equations that we wrote above here, right? Solving these equations will tell you the new XP of the particle as well as its new velocity. So what you know is this, XP of that particle. What you need to know in order to interpolate the velocity to that location is information regarding the corresponding I index of the cell that contains this particle and J index of the cell that contains this particle. If we stick to the same notation, we're essentially interested in extracting an IPJP from the knowledge of XP. That's what I mean by localization. Finding, so localize, means find the couple IPJP from the knowledge of XP. Once you've done that, we can now go back to the other question we had, which is uh, interpolation. My U velocity is defined right here. on the x faces. If I want to do a trilinear interpolation, I'll need to use the corresponding neighboring u velocities and interpolate from those four nearest uh, phase locations to the particle location. We have a staggered mesh. That means that we'll have to be careful to do the same thing for the vertical velocity, but the vertical velocity is not located at the same position. Same thing has to happen for the vertical velocity, but the vertical velocity will have to rely on those four velocities. Okay, this one, this one will be brought here, this one, and this one. Okay? So this is the uh, this is essentially our task. If we know how to solve the ODs, know how to uh, localize the particle, and know how to interpolate the velocity, know how to do some I.O. We have uh, pretty much a full Lagrangian solver, at least to deal with the one way, uh, with, the, uh, um, with the particle dynamics induced by the fluid. Um, what, are, what are we missing? We're missing a few things still, but uh, nothing particularly exciting. Uh, let me think a bit about it. Uh, So the particle can um, potentially, uh, you could be in a situation where you don't know a priori what's going to be the response time of the particle. If your viscosity is a viable viscosity, if uh, your particle is evaporating and its diameter is changing, 
uh, you would need to, uh, to be careful about that. If uh, you have a distribution of diameters of particles, right, situations where some particles have a large diameter, some particles have a small diameter, you would have small response times, large response times. So it makes sense also to have a dynamic assessment of what your time step, your integration time step for the EOD should be. So we're going to wrap our Runga uh, CUDA solver uh, around a do while loop that will adjust dynamically the time step size. It's not particularly complicated because we have a very explicit knowledge of what the characteristic time scale is, and that's this tau p that we can explicitly compute. So it's not going to be a difficult thing. So we'll add here dynamic time stepping. Sir? Yes? Sir, say it again? So if particles, um, say it again. Is a particle shared between two cells? So sh what do you mean by shared, though? So if a particle is right at the face, it doesn't change the fact that you can find. So the, the, the question, so, OK, I, I see your question. Um, ultimately, our approach here will be based on linear interpolation. So it doesn't really matter whether the particle is located right, you know, just a little bit, uh, just on the left here or just on the right. Uh, we'll have a continuous representation of, the, of our interpolation. So you can imagine that, yes, we will switch stencil as the particle goes. Um, OK, let me think about a good example. Um, so right now, I don't know what you see the best. Probably the, uh, the purple here is more visible. This is our local interpolation stencil to get the local uh, u velocity at that particle location. Okay? If the particle moves to the point where it's located right on that, uh, on that line here, our bilinear interpolation will automatically make it such that we don't use those velocities at all and we simply do a 1 uh, d interpolation between those two velocities. And then as soon as the particle moves down, just below, we'll switch to a different stencil that uses this point, this point, this point, and this point. But still, if we're right below, we'll still only be using those points. So my point here is that our interpolation approach, based on this simple uh, bilinear and uh, uh, as well as uh, combined with uh, localization on the nearest cell, that will give us uh, C0 continuity. Uh, and, and the interpolation is going to be second order because it's linear. So it, uh, there's no inherent problem with this. So that means that you just have to make up your mind, basically. If a particle sits on the edge of a cell, you decide, you decide whether it's the cell on the left or the cell on the right, but the results are not going to depend on that. You certainly don't ever want to have a scheme where the results depend on the choice like this. Uh, that would be a bad idea to have a non-continuous interpolation because as soon as the particle moves by epsilon, you suddenly would see a, a completely different velocity field. Yes? Uh, we are calculating the location of the surrounding gates, either by area minimization or by minimization. So here, I was, uh, what so we're going to do is a simple uh, uh, um, uh, combination of 1D interpolations. Uh, we could do more. We could do uh, local least square. We could do so yeah, there's many we approaches. We at least one vertex point of this square. And we are going to build up around the box based on what that vertex point. Yeah. We are going to say this again? Uh, we are, we are, suppose if we are calculating the distance uh, between the part point particle to the surrounding grids. Yes. And I will get the minimum vertex to be the top right point, top left point. So then I will build up around that point the square box or we are going to find all the four points. We're going to explicitly find the four points because it's, it's easy to do from the knowledge of the underlying staggering uh, scheme. So uh, we, we're going to say basically, depending on whether my, cell, my particle is above the middle of my cell in x or in y, I can directly automatically decide which is going to be the closest uh, box of cell or box of uh, velocities uh, that we're going to use. OK, other questions? So uh, I think there's just one more thing that I wanted to add on this, and then we're, we're going to switch to the code. So uh, here, dynamic time stepping. Say it again. Uh, 
Right, so if you have an unstructured grid, what you're going to have to do is remember where you started from. It's going to be extremely important. So if you know, and in fact, uh, it's also a way of speeding up the process uh, in, uh, with a structured code. So what we're going to do is fairly similar to what you would do in an unstructured grid. But in, a, in, a in an unstructured grid, if you don't know how to move towards a larger value of x or a larger value of y, what you would need to do is assume that during one time step, the particle cannot possibly have moved much. And therefore, the knowledge of where it used to be is essentially sufficient to start a reasonably cheap or reasonably doable uh, search algorithm. So what you'll do is you'll know the starting position and you look at your neighbors and check whether the particle lies in, the, in those neighbors. And then for each of those neighbors, you can look at the neighbors of these neighbors and check whether the particle lies in that. Assuming that you have a reasonable constraint on the, uh, on the CFL that you use for integrating your equations, the particle should not be able to move by much more than a cell during a time step size. And therefore, you should never be looking down the you know, neighbor of neighbor of neighbor, which rapidly becomes extremely expensive, too much. If for whatever reason you have a situation where your particle is capable of moving by many, many cells over one time step, then you're in trouble. Then the cost is going to be high because you're going to have to somehow do uh, some sort of an efficient search. So there's a number of algorithms that have been proposed. But again, if you have a reasonable constraint on the CFL for the integration, simply looking at your neighbors, uh, checking whether the neighbors of the original particle containing cell are the correct cell, and then going down this road, looking at the neighbor's neighbors, uh, that, that works really well. And it's very simple. OK, uh, dynamic time stepping. So there's one more thing that ends up being very annoying. Um, and that's the fact that you need, at some point, to put particles in and take particles out. Um, that ends up taking quite a bit of time, except if you're running only uh, simulations in closed boxes or simulations in periodic systems where you can just initialize the particles and they remain there forever. Um, situations where you have an inflow and outflow means that you need some process by which you add particles and some process by which you say, OK, this particle is done. It's left the domain. We don't want to continue using algorithm on it. It's not very complicated, but that it does require some, uh, some care. All right, so those are the different pieces. I'm going to show you this part um, quickly. And then we'll go through, uh, well, there's one little piece that's missing here. Obviously, the ODE integrator requires evaluating the right hand side of our equation. So we'll, not, we'll need to evaluate drag. Uh, and then I'll show you uh, the localization algorithm. And I'll show you the um, interpolation algorithm. And then we'll start playing with uh, particles uh, in, uh, in our system. OK? Any questions? I'm going to, yes. So today we're not. But in a couple of days, we will. Uh, so there's, uh, there's different responses. Uh, if it depends on the type of boundary. If the boundary is a wall, then you need to have some sort of a collision algorithm. We will do that in two days. And we will explicitly handle wall collisions. Um, if the Stokes number is low enough for our problem, even though we have a cylinder in the middle, you would expect that the particles will never really get to hit the cylinder. They should just follow streamline sufficiently well that they're not going to do too much. But essentially, what we'll do today is we'll visualize the fact that, yes, particles get in the wall, and we need to fix that. Um, so for at an inflow, there's no real problem. You have to put the particle there. So that's code that you have to write, but there's no challenge. At the outflow, there's no real problem either. Once the particle has left and you have reasons to think that the particle is not going to come back in, you just discard it, and you're done. But the wall requires some sort of a collisional model. Uh, and this, there's a number of ways that we can do that. And we'll talk about that pretty soon. Say again? So 
if you have a symmetry boundary condition, then uh, yeah, that's, that's a good point. Uh, then there's something you know. So if a particle leaves through a symmetry boundary condition, then by symmetry, that means a particle with the flipped velocity or the symmetric velocity has to have re-entered. So then what you would naturally do is take that particle, flip the sign of the boundary normal velocity, and reintroduce it. So the symmetry would have to be handled manually, um, which means completely, if this is a symmetry condition, and I have a particle leaving like this during my time step, I recognize that that particle up here needs to be fixed. And the way you do that is by realizing that there has to be, because of the symmetry, the corresponding particle that did that. How do you do this? You take that particle, you place it at minus its original, its location above your symmetry condition, and you, flipped, you flip its, uh, its velocity. So if its velocity was this, now its velocity is going to flip in the, wall, in the uh, symmetry plane normal direction. We're not going to deal with symmetry conditions, but it's, it's not too complicated. Knowing that the particle has crossed the symmetry condition is not complicated either, because we have already an algorithm. We'll need to have provided an algorithm that's, that knows where your particle lies on your mesh. Okay, so once we know how to find the ij of the particle, you'll know automatically whether you've gone outside of your domain. Yes? So if a particle is here, an interface between two different fluids. So are we already talking about three phase flows? A solid phase and, and, a, and a liquid in a gas, say? Okay, well, the answer then has to be tied to the way you deal with the multiphase, you know, the, the, the presence of those two fluids in the first place. So you don't have here, my answer has to be, well, it depends. You should know based on the way your interfacial tr treatment is handled. So we'll talk quite a bit about that next week. Uh, for example, if you represent your interface using what's called a level set method, then you pretty easily know whether you're on one side of this interface or on the other side of, uh, of this interface. And so you can decide if the quantity that you want to interpolate to the particle location is continuous. For example, you have a viscous two-phase flow, then the velocity you would expect to be continuous at the interface, then you can still go ahead and ignore the presence of the interface. If, however, what you want to know is something like, say, the density or the viscosity, then the problem is different. Then those quantities are discontinuous, and then you have to a priori know whether you're on one side or the other before you do your interpolation. But you, by definition, you will have a way of knowing on what side you are from your interface tracking scheme uh, in the first place. Okay. Okay, other questions? Yes? So why would particles get stuck in boundary layers? Ah. Well, um, there's a number of, uh, of, of problems with this. If your physical model is correct, and in real life the particles are not observed to get stuck in the boundary layers, then your calculations won't show that. So you need to find a culprit, and my guess is that either your drag law, or your lift law, or your interpolation uh, uh, approach, something's wrong. That's, that's what I would say. So uh, but that can be more concrete. And in fact, on Friday, I want to show some results that, uh, that go in that direction. For example, if you ignore collisions in a turbulent flow that has a, you know, full, a fully developed turbulent boundary layer, so say a turbulent channel flow, you'll find that particles tend to accumulate 
way more than, than in real life within the boundary layer. Why is that? Well, because of the boundary layer, right? They should slow down there. Well, but the issue is if particles accumulate there, their density increases, their the, 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 the number density increases, there's more and more. And if there's more and more particles, they're more and more likely to collide with one another. And it turns out, if you start having more and more collisions, particles end up being, uh, uh, you know, bouncing off on one another and they get redistributed away from the boundary layer. So, one in, in, uh, in, um, in wall bounded turbulent flows, a fairly natural way in which you can mess up uh, your, your prediction of concentration is to simply ignore the effect of collisions. Not having collisions will lead to orders of magnitude overestimation of the number density of particles in the wall, near the wall. But this is not a numerical question, this is a modeling question. Although it is a reasonable modeling question. So certainly, wall, uh, particle wall collisions should never be neglected, even though we'll do that today. They shouldn't be neglected. As soon as a particle has inertia, it should be possible for it to hit a wall. I'm going beyond that. I'm saying that once you start accumulating many particles in the boundary layer, the volume fraction there increases to the point where particle-particle collisions cannot really ever be neglected. So if you have reason to think that your particles will have a tendency to accumulate in your boundary layer, that probably means that you should never assume that collisions, interparticle collisions can be neglected. Those things go hand in hand. All right, can we start looking at the code? Okay. So I'll turn this off. Yes. All right, let's see if that works reasonably. So, you should have, uh, you should know where to get the material for today? Yes. Okay, so please download that. Um, I don't know if it's starred or something, but uh, uh, make it available on, uh, on your machine. Uh, it should look like this. Uh, sorry. So it should look like this. We should have two directories, one called one underscore LPT, LPT standing for Lagrangian particle tracking, underscore one way. What's meant by one way here is that for the first part of uh, our little exercise, we're not going to be um, worrying about the effect that the particles might have on the fluids. We're simply going to be concerned with how the fluid is inducing motion in the particles. And then we'll start thinking about um, two-way. In both cases, the structure should be exactly the same as yesterday. So there should be this compile and run that sh script that, com that cleans up, compiles, and executes the code. And then there should be an SRC directory standing for source that will contain just one more file. So, we're going to go first in the one underscore LPT underscore one-way directory. And in there, we're going to open up uh, in source, we're going to open up demo flow.f90. Oh, and I need to make this way larger. Is this big enough for people in the back? Probably not, right? Are we getting there? One more time or is it good? Good? So this is the same code as yesterday. 
running uh, the same code as uh, the, the, the second version that we looked at yesterday. So this is our uh, flow behind a cylinder. The I'll walk you through the few modifications that have taken place. And then uh, I'll let you, you know, figure out some of the stuff that's happened. And I'll, uh, I'll, uh, we'll try to see together uh, whether there's questions on, on the way the, the uh, localization and the installation works. So this code is, like I said, the same. I'm not going to go through the details here. I'm just going to point out what's changed. If you scroll down a bit, you'll see that we've given ourselves a convenient uh, logical parameter that tells us whether we want to use particles or not. Do we use particles, logical? Uh, this says use LPT is equal to true. If you set it to true, that uses the particles. If you don't, it doesn't use the particles. Nothing exciting there. Then I'm going to use this. to provide a few modifications to the main uh, driver uh, routine. That's going to go very fast. This is the same thing as before. We're initializing the, 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 uh, the time uh, so that we can compute the total execution time. We uh, set up the mesh. We set up the, um, the initial conditions, the boundary conditions. We put our mask, so our walls. And then from that, we generate all of our operators. Now we have one more initialization that's done only if we use like when particle tracking. And that's done by calling LPT underscore init. So there's just one handle here where we get access to, um, to, uh, to the particle initialization. The rest of the code continues normally. So we just ended this thing here. We initialize the time. We initialize the visualization. So that creates a few directories uh, for the inside output. This is our main time loop. We loop until we're done. Uh, we first adjust the time. We increment the time. Uh, we do some output to the screen. And there we go. Now, what we used to have was the velocity predictor followed by the velocity corrector based on the pressure uh, projection. We still have those two steps, but before that, we're first going to transport our particles. So we'll do, if we use the Lagrangian particle tracking, we'll do an LPT step. So that's the second handle in this. So there's just two entry points in the main code, the initialization of the particles and the, uh, and, and, uh, the, um, the, the, the solution of the particle equations. And then we visualize. We output the execution time, and we're done. That's all that's changed in the, in the main code. So there's been essentially no change there, except for those two entry points. I'll show you quickly the differences in the um, visualization. So I'm going to go and visualize. And okay. So to visualize, there's not a lot of excitement either. Uh, and we didn't go through the very details of this. Uh, if you're interested, again, we can, I'm happy to talk to you more about it. But what we're going to do is the very same way as we've done for the main code, we're going to use one module that's going to contain everything related to the particles. So basically, all data related to the particles is going to be put in one module, and this module is going to be shared so that data is always accessible. Visualize will need to extract this uh, data. And so, uh, not extract, but uh, dump this data. So it's going to be making use of this LPT module. That's one change. A little bit below. Well, our second change, which is that now, if we use the particles, we're going to be also outputting a particles directory. 
right? So when we visualize, we're going to have uh, particle data that we'll need to visualize. And then the next and last change is when we dump the data, there's going to be This is where this case file is being created. This case file is now going to be told that it will also need to show particle positions. And this is this, uh, uh, this statement here. I'll tell you uh, a little bit more about that a little bit later. And then associated with the position of the particles, we're also going to output the velocity of those particles. So there's just those if, those two if statements if we use particles. And then there's the actual output of those files which is uh, probably more details than you need, uh, but I'll just show it quickly. So that's towards the end of that file. This is labeled as particle position. I'm just going to put in that file called viz slash particles. I'm going to output the, the position of all the particles. I'm going to do that all with, a single, all with single precision data, and I'm going to put that in binary files, and that's going to be it. So this will contain the positions, And right below, I'm going to be outputting the particle velocities. OK? That's, that's it. So that's the visualization. With this, we're going to have our particles uh, readily uh, uh, visualizable, if you will. So except if there's specific interest in the I.O., uh, I would suggest that we don't spend more time on it. And we start looking. At the main interest here, okay. So the main interest being the is where all the relevant uh, um, code. For this file so I'm going to propose here one way of dealing with particles you don't have to stick to that you don't have to like that um, well I think you kind of have to stick to that this week but that's something that I found over the years uh, to be very very useful if you're writing a particle tracking code a particle from what we've talked about before, is kind of an interesting object. It is tied to a position. It is tied to a velocity. It is tied, from what we've said before, to a location on the mesh, meaning an IJ coordinate. And potentially, you would need, if you do phase change, if you do other things, you're going to start to have to think about uh, particle diameter, potentially particle temperature. Uh, the mass of the particle or particle density, one or the other. So there's a number of variables that are tied to the concept of a particle. One way of dealing with a particle is to have a number of arrays, basically have an array of particles, have an array of, uh, sorry, have an array for the particle positions, have an array for the particle velocities, have an array for the particle look, uh, uh, mesh locations, et cetera, et cetera. An alternative way is to package all this within a structure. So you can create your own derived data type and package everything and call it a particle. This is what I'm doing here. Uh, you can do that. You, know, you don't have to do that. Uh, you don't need Fortran to do that. But the idea here is precisely, is precisely that. We're creating a derived data type that we call particle type that contains all the data relevant to a particle. That is specifically the position x and y of that particle, the corresponding position on our mesh, i and j, the corresponding velocity of that particle, u and v. Here, I'm allowing for dynamic time step size integration, meaning I'm conveniently remembering how fast I've been integrating my ODEs. Okay, I'm keeping track of that. So I'm uh, putting a time step size here. 
Uh, this I'm getting ahead of myself. I should not have included that, but um, there you go. We'll also be storing collisions uh, there. Um, but uh, we're not going to worry about that. And then I'm adding, I'm adding this one parameter that I'm calling stop, which is essentially a parameter that tells us whether the particle is active or not. Why am I doing that? Well, it's because it's going to simplify memory management. So this thing, when you create a particle of that type, you have now all the data you need for viably, for reasonably uh, integrating your ODE, your ODE for a single particle. We're not going to worry with a single particle. We're, so, we're right away going to start with thinking about many particles. So I'll add one variable, which is the number of particles. And then I'm going to create an array. I'm not making it dynamic. I'm basically putting uh, together a static array of this type particle type. Basically, I'm creating a long array of those particles that we've, create, that we've, uh, that we've introduced. OK? So this is an array of derived data type. Part of one will contain all those things. Part of two will be the second particle that contains all those things, et cetera, et cetera. And in addition to that, because I've been lazy with memory management, I'm just providing a maximum number of particles. This is what that is, maximum number of particles that I'm, for which I'm allocating memory. I'm going to set, outside of all this, a particle diameter. Oh, thank you. Very nice. Uh, so we're going to give ourselves a, a, a constant particle diameter, particle density. Um, <laughs> I need to know something about the fluid density. I'm, I'm putting it in here. Um, Thank you. Um, so now that uh, we've looked at this, uh, let me see where we're we going. OK, so we identified a few uh, main steps. And now I'm going to walk you through those main steps. We said that we need to be able to localize a particle on a mesh. And then we need to be able to interpolate the velocity to the particle location. So let me go through this. This is, in the case of a structured code, the simple algorithm that we can use for identifying the location of a particle. So what are we doing here? I'm telling, the particle, I'm telling this little subroutine where the particle used to be. I have this information because I've remembered it. It is part of my data structure. My data structure contains an IJ for that particle. So that means I know, like we talked in an unstructured framework, I know where the particle used to be. I know that, as a result, my new location must be very close to that location. So I have an old I, an old J. I'm going to need to find the current of the new I and the new J. And the only parameter that I need here is the current position X and Y of the particle. Well, what I'm going to do is very simple. I'm simply going to step from neighbors to neighbors until I find a cell that is the correct, uh, uh, the cell that contains a particle. The good thing about having a structured mesh is that I can do that direction, by, uh, direction per direction. So I'm going to do that in x, and then I'm going to do that in y. In x, what does it look like? I initialize my position, my new index, as the old index. And then as long as my particle is not contained, so as long as my particle is to the right of the right cell face, okay, so I have my cell. As long as my particle is on the right of the cell face to my right, I need to increment my index. That's what I'm doing. So keep moving to the cell to the right as long as I find that my cell doesn't contain my particle. Okay, so that's my increment. If, however, my particle sits to the left of my left face, I keep decrementing my index. And that's that line. So this will either move right a number of times until it finds the right x location, or move left until it finds the right um, i location. Same thing in j. Those are two decoupled steps. Everything else, the other end, 
all those are checks to make sure that I never go out of bounds. That if a particle is going outside of my domain, I'll just say, well, okay, let's put, it, let's put you in the last cell so that we don't have out of, out of bounds um, errors later on. So this is, you know, this is four lines. Literally, this is four lines of code to do the, the, uh, the localization. Is that something that's, that's meaningful to, to you? Just looking, you know, if my particle is on the right of, my right of the right face of my cell, I just increment and look at my Damerick cell. Okay, same thing on the left. It's okay? Once I've done that, I know now what is my ij of my particle. Once I know what the ij of the particle is, I'm pretty much ready to interpolate uh, and do my bilinear interpolation. So now I know the ij of my particle, and I know the xy of my particle. Now what I want to do is interpolate my velocity to that location. What do I do? Well, I'm going to do, like I said, a bilinear interpolation. That means I'm going to do an interpolation, linear interpolation in x, linear interpolation in y. I'm going to combine the two. That's going to be also very brief. This is this little chunk of code. What am I, what am I doing here? I'm not quite done with my localization. I know essentially the cell in which I'm sitting. The issue, though, is that I'm now looking at a staggered variable. So I'm looking at the variable u that lives on the face of my cell. So I might still need to move around a little bit to find where I'm really, lo uh, where I'm really uh, localized. So that's what this little moving around here, so this is the same algorithm as before, except now I'm looking for the proper bounding u cells, not p cells, not v cells, but u cells. A u, uh, a u region will be the one that has a properly defined uh, u velocity at the, at the four uh, vertices. That's what this adjustment is, and that's the same thing in y. Once I have this, this is a linear interpolation. The position on the particle minus the position <coughs> on the left of my cell divided by the size of my cell, and then one minus that. Those are the two coefficients in x. Same thing in y. The position of my particle minus the lower bound of my cell divided by the cell size. Uh, and then one minus that. So those are the two 1D linear interpolation coefficients. I'm going to combine them together, essentially in the matrix. I'm just I'm just multiplying them uh, uh, and form a full matrix. And then I'm applying that to my local region of velocity. So I'm taking my i and i plus one cell uh, uh, velocity, j and, j and j plus one velocity. So that's four velocities that get multiplied by those four coefficients. That's my bilinear interpolation. This is now specifically done for u. Because of the staggering, we need to do that differently for v. But you can see, right, this is very, very, very few operations. So that's going to be very cheap. v is exactly the same thing. The only difference is that we have to be cognizant of the fact that u lives on the x face, while v lives on the, uh, on the y face. So the way we localize is a tiny bit different. And then what we interpolate is v. OK. So any, the, the, does the, uh, the approach make sense? Just doing the simple do while my uh, cell doesn't contain uh, the particle. That doesn't make sense. And then followed by that with a simple linear interpolation. We're all good with this? OK. So let's look at the main, main, the main piece then. I'm going to introduce, so remember we had two entry points in the code, an initialization and a step, you know, basically taking one time step. The initialization is ridiculously simple. We're simply going to create all the particles we're going to tell ourselves that they actually are not real particles. The way we're going to do that is this is the reason why I introduced this little uh, uh, variable that I call stop with my, um, um, my derived data type. I'm going to say that they're all stop particles. They don't actually exist. Okay? I'm going to be adding particles 
So initially, I'm really not doing anything. I'm saying I have zero particle. NP stores a number of particles. And they all stopped. That shouldn't say initialization. We're now integrating our equations. Now, this is the, the main function, and essentially the last function. This is the, inter this is the integration of our equations. This is where we're going to do the time integration. Before we do that, I told you that there's a boring part. This boring part is, whoops, uh, this is difficult to do. Uh, 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 I need to introduce particles in my domain. I'm going to use a very pragmatic approach here. I'm just going to be adding particles on the left. And I'm going to give them a constant velocity. And I'm going to make them active. Basically, I'm going to take their stop flag and set it to 0. So until I've added enough particles, and I have specified uh, above in the, uh, in the top of the module a particle flow rate, until I've added enough particles, I'm going to keep adding particles. OK, I'm going to increment my particle counter. I'm going to set the position to the very left of my domain, the first x position uh, in my domain. And the y direction, I'm going to randomly pick a location. I'm going to just draw a number so that, remember yesterday we had a random number generator. This is the reason why I had it. So I'm going to call a random number generator. And I'm going to uh, randomly distribute my particles between location, uh, between the very uh, bottom of my domain and the very top of my domain. I'm going to uh, localize my particle on the mesh. This is the speed locate routine we looked at. So now I'm going to figure out the i and j of that particle. Okay. Once I've done that, okay, so what I'm giving it to it, what I'm giving to it is um, I, uh, I'm interested in getting the i and j, knowing the x and y. That's basically all there is to it. There's one little salty, which is that we have walls. I'm not going to even bother with making sure that we don't place particles in the walls a priori. I'm going to do that in the most brute force way. I'm randomly going to pick a location, and then I'm going to check. Oh, by the way, if I ended up putting a particle in the wall, remove it and draw another particle. That's what's being done here. If the mask value, remember this mask is what tells me whether I'm fluid or solid in my cell. If the mask value of my particle i, j, location is 1, then I'm in the wall. The particle should be thrown away. I do that by saying, oh, the particle I've just added is bogus. I remove it. And that's it. I go back, uh, I go back up there. Then I give myself an initial velocity. Um, so a certain u velocity, no v, no v velocity in that case. We're not going to worry about collisions. And for now, I don't know what the, my time step size is, so I'm not going to worry about it. So that's, that's essentially the initialization, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, injection of particles, if you will. Now we have the time integration. The time integration is very much beautifully simple. For each particle, we're going to do a do while we're not done integrating. So this is our integrator. We're going to loop over our particles. And then until we're done integrating, we're going to take a time step, call our ODE solver, LPT solve, and then we're going to be essentially done. I have one little thing here, which is to say that if the particle has left the domain, I should remove it. Right? Reasonable enough. Since I'm allowing particles to leave, I need to keep track of how many of my particles are active and how many have left. And I do that by simply recounting particles and cleaning up my array. I do that by going through each particle. As soon as I find one that's inactive, uh, I basically get rid of it. And I compress my entire memory down to only the active particles. That's what I'm doing here. What I'm doing is I have this temporary particle array. All active particles I place in that temporary array. And then I take that temporary array and I copy it back onto my true particle array. So this is just memory management made as simple as possible. And now we have essentially all except the actual Runga-Kuda. The Runga-Kuda is the second order Runga-Kuda. It's going to be very straightforward. And this is how this looks. We're solving four coupled equations. We need two steps. First, a forward Euler by half a time step, and then a centered uh, integration with a full time step. I'm going to evaluate the right-hand side and take half a time step. 
and increment x, y, u, and v for the particle. And then I'm going to go again. At that mid-time location, uh, I'm going to re-evaluate my drag. And then I'm going to do a full-time step from n to n plus 1. Once I'm done with this, I need to relocalize my particle. I need to know where it, where, where it ended up being. And then I am, well, uh, am I done? I think I am essentially done. I will have in the process calculated the uh, tau p, the characteristic particle time scale. I'll set that as my characteristic integration time scale dt. And then this is it. Uh, I give back my particle, and I'm done. I keep saying I'm done, but I have this LPT drag, the calculation of the right-hand side that needs to happen. This is this little simple thing here. We discussed already how I'm getting the u and the v velocity at the position of the particle. So this is now the fluid, or here I'm saying the gas u and the gas v at the position of my particle. Tau p is 1 over 18 times the diameter of the particle squared divided by the viscosity. I have it. The Reynolds number is just the relative velocity, the magnitude times dp over the viscosity. This is what we talked about this morning. The Schiller Neumann drag correlation is literally just taking out tau p and dividing it by 1 plus 0 0.15 times the Reynolds number to the power 0 0.687. This is the Schiller Neumann correlation we talked about, varied up to a Reynolds number of about, uh, about 800. And that gives me my acceleration, which is just the velocity difference divided by tau p. OK? Now we are truly done. This is actually the end. Should we run this? Let me close this. So remember yesterday we were talking about um, the fact that uh, you either need to give yourself the, the, um, the, um, the proper authorization to run. So either do a ch mod u plus x of the file or you run it with an sh of the file. So is this running for everyone? Anyone has uh, having problems of any sort? Say it again. Oh, well. Okay. Um, yeah, that's unfortunate. Yeah, you guys should. So while this is running, I will uh, pop, 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 pop. I will move to we will start uh, insight again. Remember, when you start inside, you have to put the, uh, the dash capital X. All right, so. 
you should get something that looks like that. We're going to go like, uh, like yesterday, we're going to create a cut in Z and take a look at the resulting uh, flow field, which should be pretty much the same as yesterday. Okay, so this is our front cam and vortex street. As a reminder to visualize that, you first click on the complete geometry here and then you go to the, the scissors and then you're gonna create a cut in Z. So once you're there, you select Z and then create with selected parts. And then you're gonna go to the coloring of the resulting uh, plane that was created. right here and there you're going to choose to color it oops what am i doing uh, there you're going to choose to color this plane by the velocity v so the difference this time is that you saw you see all those little uh, red dots you should be seeing the particles in your in your simulation. You can see what we've been doing here. Nothing particularly exciting. We're injecting uniformly, I guess uh, with a random uniform distribution, the particles on the left with a velocity that matches the fluid velocity. When they get to the right, we let them leave. And then we're going to look at how they interact with all this. We haven't done anything regarding any type of uh, treatment of uh, collisions with the cylinder. We haven't, we haven't uh, uh, at this point, handled anything there. So there is nothing in this simulation that would prevent particles from coming in contact with the wall and potentially penetrating in the wall. So if it happens, you shouldn't be surprised. However, we know that the main feature here is that we're going to have um, a very unsteady um, flow with vortex, vortex streets behind. Okay, so now I'm showing both simultaneously. And in fact, I'll do what I was doing also yesterday. Uh, right here, I'll go to the little calculator and I will go down here and select vorticity. And I will calculate from the fluid velocity what the vorticity is. And I will color my plane using the vorticity. Okay, so we have now a pretty reasonable way of looking at this problem. I'm going to color that from, say, minus 5. Okay, is everyone more or less seeing sim something similar? Um, I'll show you just a couple more things. Uh, right now, I don't know if you can see the, the particles properly. If you, uh, if you cannot see them properly, uh, you can make them bigger by changing their pixel size. So you can make them small or big or anything you want in between. The other thing you can do um, also is if you select the measured particles, you can also color the measured particles by any quantity that is defined in the first place at the particle itself. And the only thing that we have defined at the particle right now is the particle velocity. So it is possible if you, had this plane, if you hide this plane, you can also look at the flow from the perspective of the particle velocity.
Okay. So now, looking at the code that's, uh, that I gave you, can you tell me what is the Stokes number for this flow? Okay, so you're gonna. Um, uh, boop, 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 boop. Let, let me delete that. So, this guy here is what you have to select. The complete geometry is the underlying mesh, okay. and that's what you're gonna cut. Okay, so you first need to select it, and then you're gonna cut. Um, and you're gonna cut right here. Boom, create. And now you have the mesh. This little thing here, we're gonna do this to make it uh, completely full. We're going to move our plane to the very back so that you can see both particles and um, there you go. And now I'm going to just color the particles black again so that you can see both simultaneously. This removes this highlight. There you go. And now we can make the particles larger. Okay. Yeah, so, okay, uh, if you can't see, uh, if when you see, do the clip plane, you can't see the particles anymore, the reason is just that because your clip plane is in front of the particles. So, what you could just do is look from the other side. If you look from the other side, you'll notice that uh, your monitor is only visible from one side, really. So, what you have to do is instead rotate your, your uh, uh, use your mouse to rotate the plane that you're looking at. It's kind of a silly thing. Um, let me, so I'll give you an example here. If you cut this right here, okay, the plane that is created in the process. Wait, what is going on? Okay, uh, the plane that is, there we go. Oh, it's because it was still running. The plane that's created is just in front. If you rotate, you see the poly, well, okay, the particles are right at the same location. So what we're gonna do is uh, look at this clip plane and we're going to move it down here. I'm going to show. Uh, so now you have, you see the particles in front and you see the clip plane behind. So, okay, let me show you. When I'm plotting velocity, some velocity is coming inside the cylinder. It's an error, right? Yes, um, I don't know how that happened. So masking, some sort of problem is there in the masking. So did you change anything no, in the code? No. Also, I, I was not able to see how to get the particles. Uh, well, the particles here uh, seem to have gotten stuck inside. This is, uh, so I don't know how, I don't know how you got that. If this is the original code, this is what everyone else is running. Could you re-download the code? And oh, yeah. because, uh, will, uh, yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, the one problem that people still seem to have is they can't see both the particles and the plane. The reason is very simple. Uh, it is just because the plane that we've created and in exactly the same location as the particles. So uh, NSI doesn't know how to visualize those over, literally overlapping objects. So to fix this, if I show you this plane, basically what, what you're doing now is you're looking at it from the other side and you can see the particles are not visible. Okay, so what we're gonna do is you're gonna double click on the clip plane and you're gonna take this, uh, this uh, clip position Right now, for you, it should be right in the middle. Right, if it's right in the middle, the particles are not visible. If you move it all the way at the, at the very back of our visualization region, now the particles are in the front. That's it, this is all, all that's, uh, this is the reason why this is happening. Make sense? Okay, so I had a question for you and I was serious about that question, so I, I, I want you to, you know, it's supposed to be, uh, um, you know, so far I've, I've been talking a lot. 
um, now that you, you, you have the code, I, I'd like you to think uh, not on your own necessarily. Uh, you're happy to, I'm happy with you doing that with your neighbors and discussing that together. I, but I want you to figure out what is the Stokes number for this flow. Tell me what is the Stokes number. And then from there, we'll start looking at the effect of the Stokes number on the, on the flow pattern here. There is no uh, single correct answer, by the way. You know, we're, we're talking about a flow that's non-trivial. Uh, so what I want you to tell me is how you define the time scale for the flow. And what is a reasonable estimate, uh, what you think is the most relevant Stokes number for this problem. Okay? So what is the ratio of the particle time scale to the flow time scale? Yeah, so you, you can, yeah, whatever, as long as you, uh, as, as you have some reasonable approach, I'm, I, I, like I said, there's no exact answer. Um, certainly, we have a bulk velocity of, uh, so, okay, is that something I'm saying, by the way? Um, so we have a bulk velocity of one in this problem. The flow is coming in at one, and... What is the cylinder size? Well, I have to go back and check, but you can do that as well. I think at this point I've told you something that you need to know about the code to figure out. So this is in uh, demo flow underscore setup. And what I'm using to decide where I put the walls is this little section called mass count walls, where I'm testing whether the position of my points is below 0.5. So the radius of the cylinder is 0.5, so the diameter is 1. So the cylinder that blocks is of size 1. The incoming velocity is of, uh, of magnitude 1. Okay, the viscosity is at the very top of, uh, of the demo flow uh, module. Well, not very top, but it's pretty, up, pretty high up there. The viscosity is 0 0.01, okay? So the Reynolds number for this flow, based on the diameter of this guy, the incoming velocity, and the viscosity is 100, okay? We are using, um, yes, uh, um, I think uh, this is correct. Yes, it's up there. Yeah, 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 yeah. So in the LPT file, you have the definition of the tau that we're using. You have the definition of the uh, diameter of the particle. Uh, we have the viscosity, like I said, is 0 0.01. So, let me uh, go back here. One that one can answer the question I asked. Go and open it up. Spend a minute or so making the font larger.
ready for hardcore code development, we're going to print tau p, and then we're going to stop. That's uh, my pragmatic solution. In the absence of, uh, since I don't have a calculator, ah, we have an answer. Uh, is it the correct answer? So I'm going to just output tau p from the code. 2, 10 to minus 3. I just took the tau p as calculated in the code and I'm outputting it. Yes? It's um, a problem. How do you delete? Okay, well, I, I, I don't like this, uh, uh, this shell, but let's see at least if this takes care of the problem. It's fine, right? Okay. So, yes. So you're seeing that as well. Uh, so, show me where you're running this. Can you... So, the code blew up for you? This is amazing. Everyone else is getting the... Oh, you're in um, the wrong directory. Uh, wanted you to run from one underscore LPT one way. Okay, so you're already on the second step. Yeah. Okay. Are you still seeing the same problem? It's fine. Okay. So, uh, so what's the Stokes number again? So. The Stokes number should be a ratio of the particle time scale to the fluid time scale. This is the particle time scale. I just output it for you. <laughs> New is uh, um, so uh, viscosity is zero point zero one. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. I think I might see. Look at the way I wrote my, my time scale. I didn't put a row in front of it in here because it only matters once we do the two-way coupling. So, so it is, uh, is 2.2 to 10 to minus 3. And it would give you a factor of 10, which a uh, factor of uh, 1,000, I think, which would. Yeah, OK. That would make sense. So time One is a very, very acceptable answer. The ratio of the uh, diameter of the, uh, the obstacle to the fluid velocity gives us a character, uh, characteristic time scale of one. I don't think it's the best answer, but it's a very acceptable answer. Uh, anyone can suggest a better answer to the question of what is the fluid time scale? Oh, yeah, based on vortex shedding. That's an idea. Probably the most relevant fluid time scale right now. It is, by definition, going to be pretty close to D over U. But in fact, 
the frequency of that shedding normalized by d and u is what we call the stroll number for this flow. Uh, anyone knows what is approximately the stroll number for a, uh, uh, a, a von Kamen vortex street? It's pretty much always the same answer when we're talking about stroll numbers that nature tends to like one value in particular. Point two. The uh, von Kamen vortex street will exhibit shedding at the stroll number of approximately 0.2. It will go from 0.18 to 0.24 or 0.25, something like this. Around 0.2 is the natural shedding frequency. So really, as a fluid time scale, you can use one. If you want to be maybe a bit more accurate for this specific flow, you could argue that the proper fluid time scale is um, uh, 0.2, 0.2, say, OK? So um, our, round, uh, our Soaks number here is then going to be on the order of essentially 0 0.01, I think. So we had 2 10 to the minus 3 divided by 0 0.2. Or divided by 1. So uh, on the order of 10 to the minus 3. OK, so this is a very small. Uh, I'm doing that. Uh, I, I've, I haven't computed anything. So if I'm wrong, t let me know. But we're looking at a 2 10 to the minus let me make sure that I'm not saying anything bogus here. Uh, we were looking at 2 10 to the minus 3. That we're dividing by a time scale that's on the order of 1. OK? All right, so we're looking here at a very small Stokes number. The consequence is what we see here and the fact that the particles seem to essentially follow the fluid streamlines. They occupy essentially the entire domain. And if you look at the velocity of the particle field, it is very similar to the velocity of the fluid, to the point that if you plot them on top of one another, they're essentially exactly the same pattern. All right, so this is a low Stokes number situation, the fluid uh, the particles f uh, follow very uh, uh, tightly the, the uh, trajectory of the particles, uh, the, tra the trajectory of the fluid. Okay, can we um, look at the uh, effect of the Stokes number for a little while? So we're going to be pragmatic. We're not going to bother with changing the particle diameter or the fluid viscosity. We're going to, you know, we're already in the code. And because we're in the code, it is very easy for us to hard code whatever it is that we want to see. If we want to see a uh, stroll number of one, and if we are agreeing that the proper time scale for our fluid flow is one, then we want a time scale for our particles to be one, period. Well, if we want it to be one, how about we just hard code? OK, so after we've computed tau p, so we're now in LPT, um, in LPT underscore drag, we compute tau p, then we compute the Reynolds number, then we correct tau p using the uh, Schiller Neumann correlation. We're just going to overwrite tau p altogether. Oh, why did I say 10? We just said 1, sorry. We're so we're just going to say, I want my particle time scale, my particle response time to be about the same. Well, in fact, no, let's do, let's do 10 first. It's, it's more fun. So now the particle time scale is going to be an order of magnitude larger than the fluid time scale. OK? What do you expect will happen? Shall we see? First of all, hopefully this will run. <laughs> it does. Good. We didn't break anything. And the data is directly being over, overwritten on the files that you were visualizing. So you don't need to close in sight. You can simply start, run, uh, start visualizing again. I'm going to go back to visualizing the vorticity.
So my Stokes number now is 10 if you estimate the fluid time scale as 1. Okay, my particle time scale is 10, 10 times my fluid time scale. That means I can have two, I can have 10 uh, successive changes in my fluid before the particles start seeing only the first. So basically the, the, the particles we're simulating now are essentially cannonballs. Oops, this is my old solution, sorry. Okay, so that's, that's what we're seeing now. One big thing that obviously is going to need to be fixed. Particles now are happily traversing our cylinder. Why? We didn't put in collisions. We're going to need to fix this. We're going to do that in two days. So right now the particles are traversing. After we've shed, a f we've shed a few vortices, we start seeing still some impact of the underlying fluid. Uh, and basically we start seeing some denser regions. The particles are responding to the, the underlying flow field, but not very strongly. For the most part, the particles are powering through all this. They have a, a fairly small response. Okay, um, if we were looking here at a Stokes number based on, so I said the Struhl, um, so the Struhl is the non-dimensional frequency, so it's really the inverse of the Struhl that is my characteristic fluid time scale based on shedding. If my Struhl is 0 0.2, the inverse is 5, therefore my characteristic time scale for the vortices would be five. Is that correct? No, 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 the, um, the stroll is just the ratio of time scale, I'm sorry, yeah. So this is, the, this is what it is. Now let's, um, so that makes sense to everyone, the behavior we see here. Now we're gonna go to an intermediate um, Stokes number. So we were at points, uh, at uh, t uh, the order of 10 to minus three, we went up to 10, now we're gonna go to a value on the order of uh, somewhere between, zero, uh, between um, 0 0.1 and 1, basically. I'm going to take the code, stop it, if I can't find where my mouse is. There we go. We're going to go through the same exercise. I'm going to go here, and I'm going to look at the uh, Stokes number of... Um, so this is point 0.1. We could do... Let's say, let's look at, well, I'm making things very complicated. Let's look at 0 0.25. Okay, tau P of 0 0.25, this is the Stokes number of a quarter. So this is, this is our new solution. This was the old solution, particles are penetrating in the cylinder. A new solution, because the Stokes number is less, the particles are significantly less capable of penetrating in the cylinder. It still doesn't mean that we don't need to worry about collisions, but maybe not right now. What we see is that, contrary to the very low Stokes number case where the particles were completely following the fluid streamlines, and, and contrary to the high Stokes number case where the particles were basically penetrating through this entire thing, now what we see is that, that at that intermediate value of the Stokes number, the particles seem to be very nicely interacting with our vortex shedding process. You can see, nicely visualized here, a process that is classically referred to as preferential concentration. What is happening here is that we have, we're shedding vortices. Those vortices 
are basically region of rotation in the flow that are ejecting particles out of themselves. So from here, particles are basically getting ejected and they end up concentrating in regions of high shear in between those vortices. If we advance the time a little bit further, you can see that this is not a transient, this is something that most definitely remains. The high vorticity regions are essentially devoid of particles. The high shear regions in between will see an increase in the particle concentration, uh, even though it might not be fully visible uh, with this visualization here. <coughs> okay, so this is something that we refer to as preferential concentration. The fact that particles have this tendency of getting ejected out of vortices and accumulating in high shear regions, specifically when uh, the response time is on par with the characteristic fluid time scale. So this is exactly what we're saying here. So that seems like a pretty sound response to, uh, at least it seems that this code is behaving the way we would expect. It contains the right, uh, it, it um, shows some of the, the, the rights or the expected physical uh, uh, processes. If I zoom in enough, I don't know if you can see this little guy here. Or that little guy here, as particles getting in, we still need to take care of our collisions. This is something that is um, that, that remains to be done. Okay, any questions on this? Okay, if not. I think this is right here. We're going to stop this. And now we're going to, stay, we're going to take one step forward um, to, to conclude today. What we're going to do is we're going to start acknowledging the fact that the drag force that is felt by the particles is essentially a momentum exchange between the fluid and the, and the particle. This needs to be done conservatively. There's no reason why the fluid would uh, exert drag on the particle and the fluid yet would not see the effect of the particles, uh, uh, the effect that the particles have. So this is really, this should be implemented as a two-way street. So we'll talk a lot more, uh, in a lot more details about this in the next couple of days, but the situation is as follows. Right now, we're letting the fluid influence the particles but the fluid is utterly unaware of the presence of the particles. There is no process here that can allow the fluid uh, to know about the presence of the, the particles that we've introduced. This is physically incorrect. If I put a force, that force requires the corresponding reaction. You know, if the fluid exerts drag on the particle, the particle exerts minus this drag on the fluid. So we're going to account for that now. Uh, we're going to account for that in a very simple way. There's, uh, we'll talk in a couple of days about the details of how one would account for that in a way that's uh, significantly more robust and scalable and, uh, and physically realistic. But we'll do that in a somewhat uh, pragmatic way for our purpose here. So we're going to switch to the directory uh, the second directory in this, uh, in this T2 uh, tutorial. So we were in directory one underscore LPT underscore one way. We're going to move to directory two underscore LPT underscore two way. Two way meaning two way coupling. It's not going to be fluid influencing particles. It's going to be fluid influencing particles and particles influencing fluid back. Do that on my end as well. Okay, so this is going to be surprisingly simple, provided we do it in a way that's sufficiently inclusive. Um, what we're going to need to do is remember the fact that the particle experience, experiences drag, 
we're going to need to accumulate the amount of drag that the particles have felt and we're going to have to give that back to the fluid. We're basically going to have to say every single drag term needs to show up um, in our Navier-Stokes equation. The formalism for that we'll, we'll cover in a lot more detail soon. Here, what I'm going to show you is what a simple implementation of this process might look like. There's going to be only two files changed here. We're going to change the demo flow.f90 file where we have our flow solver and we're going to change our lpt.f90 file where we're currently solving our particles. Okay? We're going to start by taking a look at the, oops, at the demo flow uh, solver file. And I'll tell you exactly what's, uh, what's modified here. And you'll see this is very, very limited. Can I? I guess not. OK, well, fine. I will be, oops. Here we are. So the first modification is the following. Now we're going to need to have source terms coming from the particles into the Navier-Stokes equation. I'm going to have this in the form of this SRCU and SRCV, a source term for the U equation, a source term for the V equation. Those two things are now going to be showing up in my calculation of the Navier-Stokes residual. Okay? Right here. Um, where is it? Then, this is now my time integration. This is my, my time loop. This is my do while in the, uh, in the main driver routine. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to set the source term for u and the source term for v to zero because I want to have a clean, empty source term before I get into my particle calculation. So those two arrays are going to be empty, full of zeros, and this LPT step is now going to fill up how much drag, how much momentum was given by the fluid phase to the particle. Okay? This effect now will be taken into account by actually saying, well, this momentum was given to the particles, let me now remove it from the fluid. So this is set to zero. This guy now will do something and fill out those arrays. And assuming that those, are, that those arrays have been filled out properly, the next step will be to include those source terms. Where do I put the source terms? Well, I put them in my Navier-Stokes equation. So I'm going to scroll down. We looked at that briefly yesterday. This is my velocity step. This is my velocity predictor. This is everything except for the pressure. This was con uh, containing convection and viscosity in U and convection and viscosity in V. And then I'm putting all this together uh, and I'm adding that to my, um, to my DUDT essentially. Well, now here's all I'm, all I'm doing is I'm saying, let me add the source term that I've accumulated from the particles. Let me add the source term in, uh, for U, for the U equation and the source term for V to the V equation. This is it. We're done with demo flow. We've just created a place to store the source term. We zero it out and then we add it uh, to the right hand side of our Navier Stokes equation in the velocity predictor. That's it. Now, there's obviously one more thing that needs to be done, and that uh, additional thing is to actually fill out the source array uh, as we compute drag. Okay, and this is going to be happening if I can, uh, so let me reopen this two ways. So we're going to open lpt.f90 again.
Okay? I'll show you there's two places where we're doing something. This is where I solve my particles. Remember this was a Runga Okay? This Runga Kuda, the outcome of it is the knowledge of the amount of acceleration that the fluid has imparted onto the particle. Well, all I'm going to do is I'm going to remember this acceleration right here. So what I'm going to say is my particle has been accelerated by the fluid. How much has my uh, particle been accelerated by the fluid? Well, by this term that was stored in drag x, in x, and drag y, and y. I'm going to be simply incrementing that at the location where the particle lives, at the ij where my, my particle has been identified. I'm going to be incrementing that. I'm not doing that right away in this SRCU and SRCV uh, um, arrays, and I'll show you why in a second. I'm doing that in temporary arrays for now, temp q and temp v that have been created for the occasion. So all I'm saying is, for each particle, we're, we, are, we were computing uh, drag x, drag y, the drag force. Now I'm saying, well, from the knowledge of that drag force, I'm actually going to create this. Uh, I'm going to remember the amount of drag that the fluid has given. I'm going to put a minus in front of it, because if the particle experiences plus drag, that means that the fluid needs to be experiencing minus, minus that same drag. Um, I need a dt that multiplies it, because it's going to be integrated over the time step. And I need this coefficient that I'm calling loading here. This is essentially the ratio of the amount of particle mass in my cell to the amount of fluid mass in my cell. And again, we'll derive that in details uh, in a couple of days. This is the density of my particle times the diameter of my particle. That gives me the mass of my particle. And that's divided by the density of my fluid times the size O. Oh, that's, a, that's a, uh, an interesting uh, weight. No, that's reasonable. Uh, di divided by the, the volume of my cell. OK? And I'm just incrementing. So I'm saying that the stamp U is the old value to which I'm adding what, uh, what I had. OK? Um, there's one more thing that needs to be done. Once I've on the U cell at the X phase and on the V cell phase. I do need to do one more thing from IJ cell to V phase for Y. Uh, the X phase for U or the Y phase for V. And that's what I'm doing here. For Uh, this, yeah, so this is, this is a very highly simplified approach where I'm basically dumping all the, all the, this entire drag effect is at the cell that contains the particle. We'll talk about how we can go beyond that uh, pretty soon. Okay, so now I'm doing this with SRC, and SRC essentially becomes half of the value on the left and the value on the right, I'm just doing a linear interpolation to the face. And then that's it. OK, so now we calculate drag, but we don't forget it. We store. We accumulate it in the cell where the drag was, uh, was felt. And then we put that in our Navier-Stokes solver. So now we have what's called the two-way couple solver. That means that fluid will know of the presence of the particles. So we can run that. <laughs> I 
I'm going to move to the new directory, st start inside again. All right, this is our problem now with two recoupling. Um, I might have changed something. Let me see. Uh, so this was old. Oh, now I open two. Um, ah, there we go. Let me close all this because I'm not where I was. Uh, I'm going to open uh, Emacs uh, source. I'm going to look at LPT again. The reason why I'm going to look at it again is because I'm interested in knowing what is the Stokes that I, that I use for this. I do not remember. So we're back. So I have a tau p of 1 here. So what we're looking at here is essentially a Stokes number of about 1, strongly coupled. Now what's going to matter, however, is how many particles we put in. We were not careful with that at all. We didn't discuss the, uh, the particle flow rate. We don't know whether we have a lot of particles or not a lot of particles. What's going to happen is that if you have a lot of particles, you will have an en the particles will have an enormous influence on the fluid phase. Basically, the mass loading in particles will directly control how much the fluid phase feels the effect of the particles. If, however, you have a very small number of particles or you have many small particles, basically, if the mass of particle is, is small, then you will not have a strong effect uh, from this two-way coupling. So I, I want to illustrate that uh, right now. So this is what we just uh, calculated. I'm going to color this by the particle velocity. I'm going to create a cut as well. There we go, I'm cutting behind the particles. I'm going to color by, uh, maybe instead of the fluid velocity, I'm, the co I'm going to color by the vorticity like we were doing before. Boom. Vort. There you go, I've now calculated the vorticity and I'm going to color by that vorticity and specifically, I'm going to color by not the magnitude, but the Z component of that vorticity. OK. So what's going on here? I guess we're still running. I should. Let me stop this. If I can find where I'm running, right here. Let's stop. So, does it look similar? Not really, right? This is very different. In fact, I don't know why my computer is so slow. And sight may have crashed here. Um, so what is going on here? Number of things that is going on. Uh, first of all, the fun and vortex street is gone. Why is it gone? Well, we can go back to what we were looking at uh, just a second ago. 
one very important parameter that appears number one would indicate very strong coupling between the phases. But remember, what we've added is this exchange term. Basically, now we remember the amount of drag, and we put it back where it belongs in the momentum equation. The important parameter here, it's not a parameter. It just uh, falls out of the equations, is what we call the mass thing, the ratio of the particle mass. So the particle density times its um, a volume divided by the fluid mass in the cell. That ratio tells us what is our local composition of our mixture. Is it mostly particles, is it mostly fluid, or is it an, you know, an equivalent ratio between the two? Let us print out what this is. With the parameters we've chosen, this value right now is 8.8. .8. That means that we have about nine times, or so almost ten times more mass in the particle phase than we have in the fluid phase. For reference, um, a mass loading of ten, uh, what, this is an area where we're not mechanical engineers anymore. This is chemical engineers. This is uh, gasifiers, uh, uh, fluidized bed, risers, downers, um, um, cyclone separators, everything related to uh, multi-phase uh, process engineering reactors. This is, this is this type of loading that we're talking about here. Uh, if you're a fluid mechanician, you probably have the completely other perspective of mass loadings being well below one. Okay, so this is a highly, highly loaded system. This is a system that's so loaded that you could almost argue that the fluid could be neglected and you could mostly look at the particles. So the fact that we've completely destroyed the von Kármán vortex street, and then now our flow looks like this mess is not that surprising. This is a particle con controlled flow here. By the way, it is still very obvious that we need a of our collisions. Okay, let's reduce our mass loading. Again, I'm not gonna worry about how we do this properly. Uh, if, uh, making it 10, I'm going to make a, you know, put together a lower loading, say 1e to the minus one, well, let's just say 0 0.1. Okay? 100 times less. Now the particle mass is going to be a tenth of the fluid mass. We're going to, well, at least the expectation is we should go back to the realm of fluid mechanics now. Oh. And I should probably remove the stop statement or else we're not going to go far. So removing the stop statement, we're running again. So lower mass loading, the particle mass is now small compared to the fluid mass. It's not negligible, but it's small. My end sight is uh, on strike, it seems. Okay, We're also, we still have a fun common vortex streets. We haven't destroyed completely the fluid mechanics of this flow. Anyone cares to explain to me why we see particles penetrating now, even though at the Stokes number of one in the one-way couple problem from uh, half an hour ago, we had almost no particles getting in? Why are we hitting, why are we getting in the cylinder now that we're two-way coupled, where we were not getting in the cylinder before that we were not two-way coupled? Let me restart inside. It's, uh, it seems to be awfully slow.
Anyone? So what should happen to the fluid in front of the cylinder in the absence of particles? It should slow down, right? It's getting to a stagnation point. So what should be going on here is the fluid should be slowing down. Now if we're looking at our particles in the absence of the fluid, what should happen to the, f to the particles as they approach the cylinder here? Well, but we're not modeling collisions here. So nothing, really. If we didn't have the fluid, the particles would keep going straight. If we didn't have the particles, the fluid would be slowing down. So right here, in this upstream region right here, the particles are naturally going to be going faster than the fluid. OK? When we were one-way coupled, that meant that the fluid was slowing down the particles. OK? But there was no consequence on the fluid. Now what's going to happen is that the, the fluid is going to slow down the particles, but conversely, the particles are going to force the fluid to, to continue moving forward and, 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 and keep going faster here. So the fluid will not be able to slow down as much as, would, as it would naturally want in the approach of the cylinder. And as a result, the two-phase system here is going to be going faster as it approaches the cylinder. And as a result, the particles are going to keep going through and, and will definitely need to put our collisions in. Okay, so this is completely expected here. That shows that our coupling is, is, uh, is making sense. Um, if we were to keep reducing the mass loading, what would happen would be essentially the same thing as we would see in the unloaded case. If the mass loading is small enough, the feedback from the particle phase onto the fluid phase is negligibly small. We might as well forget it uh, uh, altogether. All right. Let me see. Uh, let me check my notes. But I think this is all I wanted to show you for today. So I. Uh, Yeah, so th this is all I had planned for today. So we are, I'm happy to take any questions or, or you know, if you want to play with, uh, with this in any way you want. Uh, what we've done at this point is we've looked at the effect of mass loading. We will do that in a more theoretical way in, uh, well, a bit tomorrow and then we'll continue uh, in two days as well. And uh, we've looked at the effect of Stokes number, which we, would look at, which we will look at again from a, a more uh, concrete, uh, or less concrete, in fact, uh, a more textbook type uh, perspective uh, tomorrow morning. OK? And. I'll mention as well that tomorrow afternoon uh, we will be looking at this same problem as well as a number of variations of this, uh, 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 a couple of different problems, but we'll be looking at that from a, a purely Eulean perspective. So instead of being tracking individual particles, we'll look at a code capable of uh, representing the particle as a essentially as a, um, as, uh, if you will, another fluid. Okay, so that's what we're going to do tomorrow. So tomorrow we do that. The day after tomorrow we'll be putting collisions. Okay, any, any questions?
If not, oh, yep. The particle is considered as a point, yes. So if a, you mean if a particle is large compared to the mesh, for example? Yes. Well, we'll be talking about that not tomorrow morning, but the day after tomorrow morning. So right now, the inherent assumption behind what we're doing here is that it is appropriate for us to use simple linear interpolation to bring the velocity to the position of the particle. It is appropriate for us to take the drag felt by the particle locally and put it back where the particle was on the mesh. And essentially, this is it. Um, you'll notice that we haven't done anything else than just adding the source term to the Navier-Stokes equations. Well, that's obviously a problem. If I have a grid cell that's smaller than the particle, there's no fluid there anymore. Therefore, there is an obviously significant change that is required on my fluid equation at that location. So ultimately, if you get to a situation where the particles are large or not negligibly small compared to the mesh, or if you get in a situation where there's many, many particles, one of the big, big changes that we'll talk about pretty soon is the fact that you'll need to account for the volume fraction occupied by the particles. So basically, the fraction of your mesh that is not, in fact, the fluid phase, but it is instead the particle phase. Once you have some information about how big that is, you can modify your Navier-Stokes equation in, in, uh, in response to that. And so we'll, we'll be discussing about that as well. If you get in a situation where the particle is definitely larger than the mesh, then you might ask yourself, why would you have this cell size in the first place? Um, it looks like at some point you're getting into what we call the most boundary methods, so a method where you would be resolving the flow of the surface of the particle. Okay, so there, there's a, a transition from one method to the next that, that needs to occur if your resolution power is, is high enough that you can actually get to the to below the particle size. Okay, but yeah, th this is assuming that the particles are small compared to the mesh. If it is not the case, there are things we can do, and we will be discussing that soon. Other questions? Yeah. Yes, we could, we would have had to do a linear extrapolation, which would have required a small change. But right now what we've said is based on the IJ where the particle sits, that's where we're gonna put the source term. It is naive, uh, we could instead say, well, let's influence the neighboring region of particles, maybe take the information from that local particle and send it to the four closest cells or something like that. We're gonna talk about a way of doing that that's maybe more systematic uh, in two days. Uh, what we'll do is uh, we'll do a, a proper systematic filtering onto the mesh with, as, as an, with a single parameter. So basically instead of using the mesh to decide where you send the, uh, the source, we're going to use only information regarding the particle size. So we'll talk about that uh, as well. But yeah, for, this is the most, the simplest thing you can do, we're injecting the source right at the location uh, right at the cell where the particle sits. Other questions? <coughs> All right, if not, thank you for your attention. And uh, I mean, I'll stick around a little bit. And again, I welcome you to play with this and, uh, and change things in any way you want. Uh, and, we'll be, uh, and I'll see you tomorrow morning.